Hello everybody, Nitpicker1 here complaining about issues great and small for your entertainment. And today we're going to be counting down our top 5 best games of 2021. Of course, I have my victim, I mean collaborators, joining me once again to soften the blow of my shitty opinions with two objectively worse ones. Nope, you were right the first time! Hey assholes, I'm back again to help the white boy with another top 5 game of the year video. I don't want to be here. I can already tell you this year is miles. Hi! better than last year. Hopefully this video won't be as long as the last two either. That's all I have to say for the time being. Now a word from our sponsors. No moment. Rudy, quick, go before I get cold Twitter canceled. Cole's the one with the shittiest opinions. He likes Sonic Adventure 2. Well, it's that time of year again. Christmas. Oh my god, this thing is so dated. The top five games of the year. This year has me the most excited because of the amount of quality games that released in comparison to last year. You know, 2020 which was very unoriginal to put it short if you didn't watch last year's video. Fortunately, 2021 is a complete 180, and I really can't wait to talk about the games that I put down. Not to brag or anything. Oh, fuck you, Cole. My list is pretty awesome. And also, organizing my list to what games should be where was the fastest I've ever done this step for these videos, so I'm really proud of myself for that. Go me. Anyway, that's enough of me. Moving on. Alright, with all that out of the way, we want to get some disclaimers out of the way before we get started. Number one, we are counting every game from 2021, but we're also counting games from November to December 2020. Now, that, and that's because last year, I think I wanted to get the top five games of 2020 out around the time of the VGAs, so I had the deadline set to November, which is, in hindsight was not a great idea. So we're fixing that starting next year, So, but we gotta catch up for now. So all the PS5 launch titles and Puyo Puyo do count this year. Number two, obviously the only games we can put on our list are games we have in fact played and we can't really play everything due to money or time. And third and final disclaimer, while we are collaborating, none of us have any direct input on each other's list other than peer pressure. We don't tell anyone to put this for representation or relevant topics, no bullshit like that. Rudy and Mal shitty opinions are Rudy's and Mal shitty opinions. So after the video is done, make sure to comment and tell us which list you like better. Alright, with all that out of the way, let's rank our top 5 games of 2021. What are you doing? You're not feeling it? No. Okay. You're entitled to your own opinion. It Takes Two is wonderful, full of creativity and co-op action. This game was made by Hazelight, developers hell-bent on making co-op games and they nail it. It Takes Two follows characters Cody and May, a married couple having a rocky marriage and deciding to go through a divorce. Their daughter, Rose, uses dolls to help get through those tough times with their parents aren't getting along, to which she wishes this book named Dr. Hankum to make the marriage work. The book turns Cody and May into Rose's dolls and have to find a way to go back to their human forms, which means you, the players, have to platform through what to us is normal in our world, completely gigantic in scope for Cody and May, and they nail that atmosphere perfectly. It's just so cool seeing real life things through the eyes of tiny people because the world just seems so much bigger. But that's not even my favorite part about this game. My favorite part about this game is that every level has different gear, meaning the game keeps changing up every minute you're getting fatigued with your current gear. Although I just want to say, this system is also bullshit, because we're three levels in and Melody gets all the cool shit. This ain't fair. May gets a shotgun bazooka thing, and what does Cody get? Sap. Sap. So much because of the voice I gave him. I hate him. <laughs> Wait, you get... Wait, hold on. You get the explosive? <laughs> I get a bazooka? You, you Hell yeah! Now yes, that sap is something for me to shoot and blow up, but come on, that's not fun. I want to blow it. I mean, Cody wants to blow it. Not to mention in the first level, May gets the hammer and Cody gets the nail. And when a girl gets the hammer, you know what's bound to happen. Another thing I love are the little mini games sprinkled throughout the levels, giving little mini competitions between you and your friend or partner. And I win most of them in case you were wondering. And there's that one part. These red buttons look interesting. Oh, ow! What, what, what are you doing? Oh, this literally is the trophy because it's a torture. You, 
Okay, whoever, 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 whoever pitched this, whoever pitched this has got some pro- ah, 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 ah! But yeah, I, I really enjoyed this game, especially playing it with my girlfriend. It was a ton of fun, and I fully recommend it. See, I just proved it. My list is awesome. Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 is fucking amazing. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thanks. Moving on. Okay, okay. There's obviously a lot to discuss here with this new Puyo Puyo entry. Like introducing Skill Battle. I've barely played it. It's not bad or anything. Or at least now I think it's not. Yeah, China that's a lot of damage. But I just remember people complaining because certain characters were either too OP or too useless because they only excel at one of the two gameplay styles. The only times I really played this mode would be when you have to do it in the story mode, which by the way, the story mode is pretty neat. Sure, it's pretty much the same thing that happened in the first game, which is kind of stupid, but I do like the humorous moments that frequently occur when you're playing. Okay. Wow, thanks! Then let's go! Okay, bye. If you watched Cole's Mean Bean 3D Blast and Spin Vault, Spin Vault, are you fucking kidding me? If you watched Cole's Mean Bean 3D Blast and Spin Ball video, you know that I'm more of a Puyo Puyo person. I do like Tetris, but Puyo Puyo to me just has the far more simplistic gameplay. Just make a chain, it's that easy. Tetris has all sorts of things like T spin, four wide, double to triple T spin. It goes on, and that's why I can get overwhelmed at times playing Tetris. A few things that this game has over the first Puyo Puyo Tetris is the new art style, and a far more simplistic world map for the story, better tutorials, and the new animations for character spells. The best no shit ones are the two final spells, taking up half of the background to show off some beautiful effects. At launch, this game was a bit laggy with some spells, but luckily it's gotten better over time for the Switch version at least. Maybe on PS5 it never lagged, but it's good to see them fix this stuff. After the launch of this game, it was said that PPT2 was going to have some free DLC such as new characters, new modes, and new songs. Characters like Miss Accord, Cerilli, and BLUE FUCKING RAT! I remember that day like it was yesterday. The first update finished downloading, I was on a Discord call with my friends here. Went online, got to the character select screen, and saw Sonic, and I shitted ferociously that I nearly killed everyone in the call by almost giving them a heart attack. Holy fuck, I was so happy that day. If you have not played this game, please go play it right now, or else I'm gonna backcross spacewalk your ass. Okay, I failed to mention this in the introduction, so I might as well get it out of the way now. I have a bunch of things to do, so nothing I do this year will come close to the length of Streets of Rage 4 or Doom Eternal. With that being said, here's my number five. Hey guys, we finally have Persona 5 on the Switch. Oh, sorry. It's a sequel that's not as long or a JRPG. God damn it! Persona 5 Royal is a really good RPG. Honestly, one of the best I've started in recent memory. We'll also never get in on Switch, so stop getting your hopes up. So when I saw gameplay for Persona 5 Strikers, I honestly thought, holy shit, it's Persona 5 Revengeance. Okay, I know it doesn't play like Metal Gear Rising, but I was obsessed with the game at the time, so lick my tank, bit. Everything checks out. Same art style, flashy gameplay, waifus, and a random child. Wait, what? This is Sophia. She's adorable. That's all I need to say on that matter. The game is basically Hyrule Warriors, but black and red so better. The soundtrack still slaps because, you know, it's Persona. I wasn't this nominated for the best soundtrack at the Game Awards. My only problem with this game is honestly just a personal preference. I don't really like how you have to actually watch over your teammates because I'm focused on trying to fight the thing in front of me. But aside from that, this game's really fun. I haven't finished it yet, but you know what? I'm gonna put it on the list because I have nothing else to put on here, so play this game. It's really fun.
Metroid Dread, or Metroid 5 if you want to get fancy, the game that finally arrived after being a rumored DS title finally resurfaced and was developed by Mercury Steam, who proved themselves with the franchise after making Metroid Samus Returns on Nintendo 3DS. Samus investigates the X on planet ZDR. There she encounters a warrior that strips her of all of her suit's abilities while exploring the planet of ZDR. The game is a 2D platformer shooter, where you explore dark desolate areas as you fight your way through challenging enemies and boss fights and regain all of your suit's abilities. People will argue that this game is game of the year, so why is it only number 4 on my list? Well, it's just not my thing. Ah! Oh my god! <laughs> I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. Okay. Uh... So... Let's try here. <laughs> I didn't do early. What am I <laughs> Okay, that's <laughs> Just gonna drink my coffee here. <clears throat> totally not stalling, just uh <laughs> just drinking my coffee. I went up. I'm good. I went up. Well, well, you also went point. down on your uh, Actually, hashtag Nintendo. Give me the more fall. What the, heck? The, the, the Emmy's just completely gone now. He's on the other side of the map. Uh, hey, hey Emmy, come over zone. here! Come, yeah, no, he's he's not, 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 not. <laughs> I am oh, You were supposed to soak with that black in the middle. And Damn it, Ernie! You were supposed see, to use that See, see, Jacob. See, see, Jacob, 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 Jacob. I could have, Matt. I could have. But see, my pants were so full of shit that I had to <laughs> I obviously really like the game. I do, but I personally preferred the other three games I'm about to talk about. But believe me, I love the exploration, the atmosphere, and even the challenge. I'm not a big fan of challenging games. Like, yeah, I obviously want to feel challenged by a game, so that way I feel like I beat it. But I'm not a fan of the face a boss like 50 times, and when you finally beat it, you'll feel so good. E yeah, that, that's not my thing. <laughs> Metroid Dread kind of reaches there at points. It's not Dark Souls or anything. It's just kind of that fine line between hard and challenging and just easy enough for me to pick up and play it. I respect everything Metroid Dread offers, and believe me, it deserves everything it's gotten praise-wise, but for me, yeah, I, I just think the game is pretty good and that's about it, so I'm placing it at number 4. But keep doing what you're doing, Metroid. Can't wait to see more. So what do I say about Persona 5 Strikers, other than the fact that for January it's going to be on the PS Plus thing, I already downloaded it by the way. Well, it's simple. Mom, can we have Persona 5 on the Switch? Well, we already have Persona 5 on the Switch, it's Persona 5 Strikers. Out of all the games here, this is the one I was most hyped for, mainly because following leaks and watching the release date trailer when it came out was so exhilarating. That trailer showing February got me all like, oh shit, that's soon. And the way it was presented too, playing the Blooming Villain Strikers remix. And all those desires you stole. We're taking them all back. Ugh. Couldn't be any more hype than that. If this was shown at a state of play or Nintendo Direct or something, I would have exploded and maybe gotten my ass beat with a belt for my parents. I got it on Nintendo Switch because I played the Japanese exclusive demo on it, so. Yeah. Plus, I didn't get D's Nuts LOL Age of Gotham, even though I played the demo of that too and I liked it. I just heard that people didn't like the story, which was, you know, the main selling point. But at least the gameplay is good and better than the first Hyrule. So I needed something to fill my Koei Tecmo needs. Fuck you, Ninja Gaiden and Samurai Warriors 5. Man, don't you just love it when the script gets outdated? Yeah, me too. Okay, back on track. Don't let your mind play tricks on you when looking at gameplay. While this may just be a Dynasty Warriors clone with the Persona skin, I'd argue it's a lot more than that. It's far more strategic than what the gameplay makes it out to be. See, when I was playing Age of Gotham, I was just mashing the shit out of the Y button. Now, there were some other cool moves to do, however, they're not as rewarding as what Strikers does. Strikers has the combos like Y and X, Y, Y, X, Y, 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 X, and Y, 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 X. Oh my goodness. Every time you press X after a few Ys, your character's persona will do a special attack without the cost of any SP. 
Now, that may sound like SP is kind of unneeded then, right? Okay, you're not wrong about that, but just let me finish. Remembering what the Persona does grants you a reward of no SP usage, so you could just use the SP for healing, buffing your party, or nerfing the opponent's stats. Yet, for some reason, On can nerf the opponent's stats without the SP usage, but from what I know, she's the only one. You'll mainly want to use the SP for healing because, good grief, this game is hard, even on normal difficulty. Which, now that I say that, let me just say this real quick. This game is not as short as people make it out to be. Yes, the game is challenging. That is what I agree with. But it is not 35 and a half hours. What the fuck? The first jail is so fucking difficult. I had to grind to beat this McCoy. And Alice herself was not that easy either. But at least it was a fun challenge. Then there's also the fact that the game drags on. Like, I think there was supposed to be a cooler plot twist, but you knew something else was gonna go down, but everyone in the game was acting like it's the end, so come on, why? But the gameplay is still fun, at least. Like, sure, I hate how the story goes closer to the end of the game, but luckily fucking the shit out of the shadows is fun. Anyway, returning from Persona 5 Royal, kinda, are the Showtime attacks. They work differently, but they have the same name, so I'm calling it returning. All you have to do is fill your character's gauge on the right, and once it's full, you press X and A to unleash a massive blow that hits super hard, especially if it hits their elemental weakness. I like looking at the animations and Joker, but just like Persona 5 Royal Showtimes, they do a great job showing the character's personality, and they have so much expression that I never get annoyed by watching them. Of course, I couldn't talk about Persona 5 Strikers without bringing up the soundtrack, and BOY! It does not disappoint. Welcome to the Jail is awesome. Jail themes are nice. The new battle themes are awesome. Seriously, I love what you wish for. And yes, the Strikers remixes of some of the more common songs in actual Persona 5 are amazing. Well, that surprise is okay, not great. But again, Blooming Villain. Holy shit. I like Strikers. I really do. But the story later on gets kind of annoying. The only thing that kept me going is the characters having actual conversations that brought good laughs and made Anna not hate Morgana as much as she did. So shut the fuck up, idiot! Come on, Skull. Phantom thieves are usually supposed to be classier than that. But not this time! Worthless hunk of junk! Hey, Anna and I made a tier list, so check out our 100% accurate tier list here. When it did end, though, god fucking damn it, I cried. We'll miss you, Sophia. We love you. Ching Chong. It all makes sense the end of the day. Kim. Come on, you knew I had to do it. This is a game I'm pretty sure everyone's been familiar with at some point. Released in August of 2010, a little bit before or after the movie, I don't really remember and I don't feel like checking right now, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World the game came out for the PS3 and Xbox 360. Now if you were lucky, you were actually able to play the game a good amount before the eventual takedown in 2014. Now if you were like me and a bunch of other people, you had to wait till September 10th, 2020, when this game actually got announced to be coming back. Yeah, remember 2020? Remember when we said nothing happened? Well, this trailer came out. <laughs> Scott Pilgrim vs. The World of Bouncing Tits is a really buggy game with whack online and less cheats. And yet, it's still one of my favorite games I've played all year. I know it doesn't really make any goddamn sense, but give me a second to explain before you try and fucking murder me. Scott Pilgrim is one of those games I couldn't help but love. The art style is great, the soundtrack is up there as one of my favorite fucking gaming soundtracks of all time. It's a fucking bop. And these animations are just great. Honestly, I'd watch a whole show based around the books. Which, um, that got confirmed a few, like, weeks ago, probably whenever this video goes up. Sorry, I'm off script a little bit. 
But that was confirmed that we're getting a Scott Pilgrim Netflix series. I'm really hype and I hope it'll be good. You have six playable characters, seven if you unlocked Mega Scott, and they're all fun in their own way. Now don't worry, this isn't gonna be like Streets of Rage 4 where I give like a whole ass analysis on each character, cause nor do I have the time or patience to do that this year. Just thought it'd be worth bringing up. If you don't know the plot of this game, then where the fuck have you been living all these years? Scott is a deadbeat who was dating this piece of Kung Pao chicken knives chow. Yes, I'm fully aware of how racist that is but the movie did it first so get off my ass eventually scott finds this really sexy chick that has blue hair named ramona flowers and yes i meant every word i said he then decides hey i want to fuck her and proceeds to you know try and do so and up dating but that's after scott has to beat the shit out of these seven deadly exes that she got yes I said X's, she's canonically bi. There's a lot I left out because this game is based off of the comic named Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which is the second one in the entire fucking series. I don't know the name of six, so I'm gonna go with series and the movie. But whatever. Moral of the story, Scott fights seven evil exes and gets some pussy. The drawbacks with Scott Pilgrim are apparently nothing new, but I'm still gonna bitch about them. Random bugs halting progress, your character randomly disappearing in survival horror. Yes, that actually happened to me. Here's the clip that I put on Twitter. And the online's so bad that it should get a video of its own. Bro, that's fucking nasty. Aside from those issues, which seem to be a very hit or miss thing, if this is your first time playing Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, I think you'll like it. I sure did, and I have no shame of putting this up at number four on this list. By the time you're seeing this, I should have a video of the Switch version of the game released on my channel, but yeah, I love Life is Strange True Colors, and no, it's not just because I got a review code for it. I loved it before that on the PlayStation 5. Life is Strange True Colors is an emotional experience, making sure that you feel something, anything, by the time you're done. Without spoiling anything, you play as Alex, a new kid on the block with a dark past who has the power to read very strong emotions. With that power, you'll have a deep connection to the people of Haven Springs, and most of the characters are great. Ducky is probably my favorite character. I'm trying not to spoil anything, but let's just say there's a moment in the game where you need to get the town on your side, and once I did the correct steps to get Ducky on my side, I fucking cheat. While I may have some light problems with Life is Strange True Colors that I won't get into here because it involves spoilers, True Colors is still a great experience, and I think anyone should play it if you are in the mood for an emotional roller coaster. And just for more of a casual experience, Life is Strange can be played by anyone, so I think you should play it. It's on the Switch now, which I did a review of, so you can go watch it if you want. Oh god, I have to go back to 2020 for this one. No! Remember Nintendo Direct Partners Showcases? No? Okay, good. September 2020 was when Partner Showcases became tolerable, I guess. It was good for a Partner Showcase due to how low the standards are, but for an actual broadcast, it was still poo poo. Okay, I actually take that back a little bit. Maybe this one was probably the best one because you had things like Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter again, Ori, and Ballad Wonder. The main highlight for me was Monster Hunter Rise. I was so interested in Monster Hunter Rise that I got Monster Hunter World for my PS4. I sucked at it, but I eventually got used to it, and I admire how good it is. The demo came out for Rise just in time when I finished, quote unquote finished, World, and I had just as much fun, if not a little more, mainly because I actually had friends to play with either at school or on Discord. Demo 2 came out where Magnum Mala was an option at the hardest difficulty possible, Then yeah, it fucked me. It fucked me good. Played with friends at school? Fucked me again. This thing takes out 75% of your health with one strike? Fucking hell. Allow me to get a few things out of the way first. The menu theme? Awesome. The village theme? Awesome. The gameplay? Awesome. The wire bug? Awesome. This game? Is awesome. I do have a bit more bias because I actually got people to play with, 
and Monster Hunter is just one of those games where you get a better experience in multiplayer, I feel. The wire bug makes the gameplay so much fun with giving monsters that hard punish or dealing that big damage when they're stunned or trapped, it's so satisfying. I named my Polymute Scribbles and my Palico Mr. Mumbles. Only one of these are a reference to something, so if you get it, then good job, sugar. This is how they look now, and I gotta say, these armor sets for you and your buddies are really cool. It feels like I haven't played this game as much. I mean, look at how many hours I have. But, I mean, I guess it kind of looks like I did, so there's that. I mean, I probably played this game the second least. It's not really an achievement, it's more so a disappointing fact, but I got a good amount of time off it. I honestly wish I had more to say about Rise, but I feel like I haven't played it enough to give it the words that it truly deserves. They had this Rush Mega Man collaboration that I was very far behind in, so I wanted to work up to it. But I only have one of my friends to play with, and we may or may not have stopped either because he was busy or I was just stupid and playing other games. Putting that aside though, this game is awesome, and you should definitely get it right now. Alright, y'all can literally piss off for this one, because I know it was on my honorable mentions last year, but I want to talk about it. Because Spider-Man No Way Home is a great movie, and this is the closest thing that we have to a Spider-Man game in the last, like, year and a half. Spider-Man No Way Home is here. And we got a teaser for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. So of course I'm going to find any excuse I can to talk about Spider-Man. Since I finished this game in 2020, Cole gave me a pass. Spider-Man Miles Morales is not only one of my favorite games I've played this year, but one of my favorite games of all time. I'm definitely not biased towards Miles. From the controls, to the combat, to the visuals, aside from Peter's new face, to the OST, what's not to love about this game? This game is centered around everyone's favorite need. Latino Miles Morales, and they did a good job showing both sides of him, but that's a discussion for a different day. The gameplay is basically like Spider-Man Peter Parker's, but with new combat mechanics. Well, one anyway. Everyone knows about electricity, right? Yes? Okay, good. Miles has a lot of that and it never gets old. Miles also has more drip than Peter does too. I will talk about the story, but the ending pisses me off. So that's as far as I'm gonna go. If you're ready for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and you wanna play a game that stars Miles Morales, then here you go, my third favorite game of the year. My fucking phone went off, this is stupid. Ratchet and Clank is the prettiest game ever. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, of course made by the lovely people over at Insomniac Games, who are THE developers for the PS5 right now. Along with Miles Morales, this game is no different, taking full advantage of the PlayStation 5's features and fidelity. To create a game that looks so pretty, I want it to rip me apart if you know what I'm saying. You follow Ratchet and Rivet, two dimensional counterparts that wind up working together to stop the evil nefarious from both dimensions. And that's pretty much it. This game is really great and I love it. The gameplay is top notch Ratchet and Clank with plenty of weapons at your disposal from your standard pea shooter to a water sprinkler that grows plants and stuns enemies. And that's all I have to say. The game is just great. Go buy it and play it. If you can get a PS5 and if you don't have a PS5 then... I think we have to build a new one. Once upon a time, there was a high school graduate named Rudy. He had a job right after high school, but that job eventually laid him off. This was his third job, mind you, and he's only 18 and just recently turned 19. So he was unemployed for about four months. He considered universities, but hates the thought of online learning because he almost failed junior year of high school because of it, so he wasn't planning on going just yet. And probably not anytime soon because of what we know. During those four months, he needed something to do. He got a PS5 as a graduation gift after all, and he wanted a lot of games on it to keep him occupied until he found another job. Enter the Tales series. Or Tales of if you're that guy, fuck off. Another Mexican he knew had him curious on Tales when he put over 200 hours of Vesperia on his Switch. 
So back in April, Vesperia on PS4 was only 10 bucks and he couldn't say no. He played it and loved it. Then he bought another Tales game when it was on sale, that being Berseria. He thought it was also pretty good. Steam Summer Sale happened and he bought Symphonia because his laptop is poo poo. He didn't play it until months later because he likes to touch grass. But as he was looking, he saw a listing for another Tales game on Steam. Okay, let's get to Arise. This was my third Tales game and honestly my favorite out of the bunch that I played. Something about it just feels classic and modern at the same time. It's a weird thing to say and I wish I could describe it better, but I just can't. Either way, this game is gonna go down as being a classic JRPG. The moment I played the demo, I immediately knew I was gonna be in love with this game from start to finish, and yup, I was right. Tales of Arise looks absolutely gorgeous on the PS5. This isn't your Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest you're looking at, no bitch. This is fucking Tales of Arise. I swear, I was just standing still moving the camera around just to admire the sheer beauty of this game whenever I got to new areas. Elden and Encia. Oh, it's so beautiful. This is easily a visual masterpiece. Now enough about the graphics, let's talk about the gameplay. The thing every Tales game changes when it comes to newer entries. It's fucking amazing. That's it. I wish you could have more than six arts when you're on the ground and in the air, but whatever, the combat is still fun regardless. And also, it's always fun quoting the characters. Searing Tempest, amass my will! Flare Tornado, dance in the wind, air thrust! Here's how the combat works. By walking to an enemy, you'll be brought to a field where you can freely move- Freely? I'm gonna shit. You'll be brought to a field where you can freely move around in a 3D environment. You can press R1 to do a string of normal attacks, and at any point during it, you can press triangle, square, or X to do a special move called an art that has its own special abilities. The same thing also applies to when you press circle to jump, aerial attacks, and aerial arts. Arts use a meter at the bottom called arts gauge, or AG for short. Some use one or some use two. Some can even go as far as using three or four. There are so many possibilities for combos in this game, and that's what makes it so much fun. Like every RPG, enemies have elemental weaknesses. I don't think they do much other than more damage, so if there's more to them, I'm sorry. R2 allows you to dodge an incoming attack or block if you're playing as Kisara. By dodging perfectly, time will slow down for a bit and your character will start glowing, and when this happens, you can do a counter attack for a big boy punish and start a combo from there. You'll also pretty much teleport to the attacker, so hey, it's a nice reward for using that little brain you have there. Each character is really different from one another, but they are so much fun to play as. There's a new mechanic in this game, and it's called Cure Points. Basically how this works is whenever you use a healing art, or an art that buffs a party member's stats, which I never did, what the fuck? It'll diminish some of the cure points, and the way you get cure points back is by purchasing these expensive ass oranges and pineapple gels! Why the fuck is this shit 9,000 gold? Or a campfire, which is the best way to go about doing it. I saved the best for last. The strike boost. Here's the instructions. You just do a long combo, and an indicator will pop up on screen. Pressing any direction on the D-pad makes two out of the six party members do a fantastic finisher that if it's the last enemy, it will play in slow-mo and you get to admire the amazing visual effects from the attack. All of them are so awesome. I love the story too. Alfin is a Dan slave who suffers from amnesia, and with the first party member that he meets up with, Shion, a rented girl with a curse called Thorns. They are on a mission to defeat the five evil lords that hold the power for them to continue their mission to possibly regain Alfin's memory and not live a Danon slave anymore. Alfin! Much more happens from there on, but that's just the main thing to see as your objective. No! I fucking love Tales of Arise, and this is a great entry point for the series. Go play it. You won't regret it. Best JRPG of the year, baby! Holy mommy fucking shit, Metroid Dread isn't my game of the year? Yeah, well, there's a reason behind that. I didn't really play much of Dread because I really don't play my Switch. And like last year, I didn't really want to share a number one with anybody, so I thought it'd be cool if I just went ahead and put this at number two anyway. Metroid Dread is a fantastic game, and just looking at the trailers, you can see that. The game's atmosphere is absolutely unsettling. The gameplay is so smooth. Seeing this game get revealed at E3 this past summer was absolutely immaculate. Honestly, kind of mental even. 
not to mention this game's pre-orders beat pokemon let that sink in for a bit the sad reality is we're not gonna see prime 4 for another 20 years i'm saying that so we can see it sooner hopefully i'm not gonna talk too much about dread because like last year in my number two someone else has more to say Well, 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 Square Enix, you made it twice on this list and even got Game of the Year two years in a row. Well, anyway, why the hell is Guardians Game of the Year on my list? Well, let's talk about it. Guardians of the Galaxy is what I'd like to call a single player co-op game. I know that makes no sense, but it's a single player game where you can call your AI controlled team members to perform certain tasks to help you get through tough enemies and story progression. But you also wield the elements with Star-Lord's blasters. I only got ice and lightning in time for this video, but it works great and is very fun. But what sets this game apart from the rest? Well, two things. First, there is what is called a huddle mechanic, where after a bit into battle, you huddle up with your team and try to figure out what's wrong with them and select something to say to them to get them pumped back up and back in order so they fight as a team. But after you select your line, and whether they seem to enjoy it or not, Star-Lord plays a licensed track for the rest of the fight. It could range from wake me up before you go-go to as someone who listens to music all the time while I do pretty much anything work related, I appreciate and relate to this feature a fuck ton. But then the other thing to set this game apart is the dialogue and humor. The game is freaking hilarious, and a game that makes me genuinely laugh is a game that makes me genuinely happy. Rocket's a lovable asshole, Drax is ready to kill everyone on the team, Gamora is an assassin, Star-Lord is the leader, and Groot is Groot. The game just oozes with charm and personality, which is something the previous Square Enix's Marvel game, Marvel's Avengers, wishes it had. Before you named it, my skin is not green, it's teal. Teal? What? Ah! Ah! Amazing! I should have been recording! Bridge over! I want to see if he's alive! And we'll bag that monster. Uh, Quill knows all about putting thumpers in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and getting monsters in the sack, too? Last and definitely least, Peter Jason Quill. That's it? That's all you wrote? It was a character limitation. <laughs> Contraxia. Cosmonaut surprised Pesky Raccoon enjoy garbage planet. <laughs> restrooms do provide valuable information. All in all, Guardians of the Galaxy I think is a great game, and I think you should play it if you're into Marvel. And you know, even if you're not into Marvel, the game is great for everyone to play. Hoping Marvel games continue to be good, and with three certain games coming on the horizon, I think we're in a wild ride in the world of Marvel video games. Could it have been anything else for number one? Didn't think so. How you doing, young lady? Uh, shut up. Metroid Dread is more than amazing. It's fucking fantastic. Metroid 2 on the Game Boy was my first ever Metroid. I think I still have the cartridge, but I took off the sticker because little old me over here was and still is a big dumb stupid idiot. And then I played a Super Metroid. I wasn't able to get back into it until... <coughs> Then I played the 3DS Metroid 2, and I had a lot of fun. That's it. Then there's Fusion that I played on my Wii U. It's super fun, but why is there so many fucking power bombs? Enough of that, finally. E3 2021. I had work that day, fuck you. I missed that, but my friends caught me up, and it was shown that a new 2D Metroid was here to keep you company, while Prime 4 shows you that games will never release. Once I finished my first playthrough of Dread, I didn't realize how much I love it until I played it again on a hard mode. Like, obviously I knew I was gonna have a good time because, well, Metroid. But oh my fucking god, I'm in love even more now the second time around. Let's get negativity out of the way first because no game is perfect as 99.9% .9 of gamers know. This game is short. Very short. I'm not shitting you, the only thing people say about Dread is that it's really short. 
and the fact that it's sixty dollars. But that's a topic for another day. So be quiet. Dread is without a doubt many people's first two D Metroid, and yes. Despite this being Metroid 5, it is an excellent starting point. It doesn't have the linearity that Fusion had, so you as a player can explore things the way you want to, but still get a good idea on where to go. It's a nice balance. As you are playing through this game, you'll encounter some things that you can't take out with your current loadout. But then you get the upgrade that you need to take care of it, like the diffusion beam, or the plasma beam, or getting the various suit, and getting the gravity suit to access those hot and cold areas that you've been seeing everywhere throughout your mission. The upgrades are such a nice treat in this game. I get the same amount of excitement for each new one I obtain. Especially the morph ball, Jesus fuck it takes so long to get the morph ball and now I finally have it, thank you Nintendo. I had to kill one of these scariest shit Emmy, but I can finally go ballin' now! Every single thing that Dread has, good graphics, 60 FPS gameplay, although it may die a bit during bosses, but that's fine. Nice and tight controls, a great story, hehe, <laughs> X-Parasites, a lovable Adam, very cinematic cutscenes, especially towards the end, a great use of every single button on the Pro Controller, fantastic boss battles and Chozo soldiers, and a satisfying ending that is bound to make everyone who played this ready for the next mission. God fucking damn it, I'm cringe. I can't stress this enough, this game is so fucking good. Well, no, it's extremely fucking amazing. I love this game so much, and while it didn't win Game of the Year at the Game Awards, it's still Game of the Year in my heart. That's how much I love Metroid Dread. This game is amazing, it is worth $60, and it's also fun 100%, that's something I didn't expect to hear myself say. But yes, go play it. Play it now. Please. Before I start this segment, I just need to point out that I'm going to have to hold back on spoilers a lot. Because this specific game is based off of a fantastic anime. anime a lot of my friends told me to watch it and you know it looked cool from the, the little bits i've seen but they told me i would really like it once i just sat down and gave it a chance and well i did and now i'm obsessed so thanks guys you've created a problem as stated prior demon slayer the hinokami chronicles is based off the anime so i'm not going to go through the plot too much all you need to know is that it's emotional and honestly kind of fucking epic I'm on the second arc of the game right now, but I'm not gonna lie to you, I fuck heavy with this combat. This game was made by the same people that made the Naruto Ninja Storm games. And after playing Demon Slayer, I might honestly give those games a shot. The combat is fast, fun, responsive, and a little broken thanks to Water Wheel. The game has the standard fighting game shtick. Online, local, training, which you need to do if you want to platinum the game, if you care about that kind of thing etc. The voice acting is ripped right from the anime with a few new lines I assume, and the OST is ripped directly from the anime which is why you're not hearing any of it in this video. I don't think I want to get this video taken down because I included music from a fucking anime. Now I wasn't the biggest fan of the game's art style at first, but as I kept going, it grew on me a lot, especially when I played the game in both 2k and 4k, like this game looks fucking amazing. Now this game isn't without its problems, water reel needs to be nerfed, and the lip syncing is whack as shit. Granted, those are the only things I can really pick up on as I'm very early in the game, but maybe my opinions will change the more I keep playing. Doubt it, but there's a maybe. Now, when you look at my list, you might be wondering, why is Demon Slayer at the top? Well, there's a few answers for that. The first answer is more so of, Cole said I couldn't put DMC5 at the top of my list, that fucking cock goblin. The second is the, I didn't really play games like that this year, like, I mainly just watched TV. The third reason is just, I had fun. This, like Scott Pilgrim, is a game that I can just sit down, turn my brain off, and enjoy. And there aren't a lot of games like that these days for me. That's honestly why Demon Slayer is so high on my list. As a fan of the anime, a guy who loves fighting games, and someone who wanted something just more tame, I got what I wanted. That's honestly why I consider Demon Slayer my favorite game of 2021.
even though if Cole wasn't a fucking bitch, it'd be Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition. Seriously, I fucking love that game. Play it. Alright, well that's it for our top 5 games of 2021. It's a little bit late, in fact I think I had a name change before this video came out, <laughs> but at least it's finally out. 2021 wasn't the best games had to offer, but I'd be lying if I said if it was better than 2020 because guess what, it wasn't. Oh my god, we're finally done. Seriously, this was actually a pain in the ass to even finish. It took us a month and uh, I'm kinda not sorry. Well, I guess it's the part where I have to plug myself, isn't it? Okay, well, here we go. I'm gonna go lightning speed. My name is Demonic Raiden, as everyone fucking knows. And I have a channel. It's right there. You know, see, right there. Just put a screenshot, Cole. Thanks. There's also another channel I have called Raiden, where I put my music shit. Yes, I'm a musician. Please actually fucking kill me. With that being said, see y'all in the next video. If we ever come back to the channel, please don't let me come back. I'm going to actually fucking riot. Jesus fuck, saying that this ride was wild would be a massive fucking understatement. But yes, everyone, that concludes the top five games of 2021. <laughs> Very late, I know, but at least it got done. I'm pretty much just saying what Cole said, apparently, because I got nothing else to add other than saying, like, hey, thanks for watching, or whatever. Oh, uh, I mean, what do you think of my list? What do you think of Mal's list? What do you think of Cole's list? Go ahead, just let us know, man. I, I want to know. I want to see those comments. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you like it, make sure to hit that like button. And if you're new, make sure to subscribe. Got a bunch of great content in the works. And I'll see you in the next one.